Welcome everyone to this EPP group talk here in the European Parliament on migration. A very serious issue that is being dealt with uh, throughout the EU, uh, with the European Council, with the Parliament, with the European Commission. Uh, you know, I just read a, um, a, a commentary by somebody from the Carnegie, um, uh, the Carnegie um, Foundation that uh, calls migration the Achilles heel of the EU. Kind of want to get your feedback on that uh, eventually. Uh, the Mediterranean crossings have increased by uh, 50% over this past year. Uh, there is an EU action plan right now to deal with that. Uh, there's also a migration pact that is not yet adopted. And that's what we're going to be talking about right now with Thomas Tobé of Sweden. Uh, you are a chairman of the Development Committee, a member of the Union for the Mediterranean, and a member of the Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs uh, Libe uh, Committee here in the European Parliament. Also joining us is Jeroen Lenners, uh, also in the Libe Committee. Uh, you're from uh, the Netherlands. Uh, and you are EPP Group Coordinator, or spokesman, shall we say, on uh, Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs. So perfect guys to talk to about this issue. Um, let's talk about this issue, the situation well, just, now. Just maybe to yeah. add as well, because I think Do. the most important thing is that Thomas is the rapporteur on the most important piece of legislation we are currently working on in the European Parliament on migration. Ah, uh, so, so in that sense, he is the, the, the guy to talk to. Then you're the first guy to talk to. No, well, who Obviously. knows? Who knows? <laughs> then, let's talk about, let's, let's frame yeah. the situation now. Uh, let's start with the, the fact that the Mediterranean path, they call it, is up by 50%. Can you tell us how, how serious this situation is? It's a life and death issue for a lot of people. Right? Of course it is. Uh, and and what, what we see now is actually, in a way, uh, we're coming back to some numbers, uh, you know, that we used to have discussion about 2015, 2016 for some of the countries. Oh. And that is, of course, very serious uh, because, I mean, the main problem uh, that we have is uh, that we have too much irregular migration to Europe. And uh, this caused a lot of uh, press, of course, because we have a, we have a huge problem uh, on the frontline member states. We have people dying at the Mediterranean Sea. There's only a few member states that take responsibility. And in a way, we're at a crossroad now. We, we either go in the direction where member states uh, will keep acting independently to find their own solution, or we go the other path, and that is to try to find a common European approach. Can I add a couple of figures here that I see from uh, uh, Frontex says that more than uh, 128,000 illegal border crossings into the EU via the Western Balkans during the first 10 months of the year. Uh, and as of the, the end of 2021, there were more than a, three quarters of a million asylum cases uh, mm -hmm. that were uh, still pending in the EU. Um, serious situation. Well, no, absolutely, and it's what Thomas already has said, but you see, indeed, the Mediterranean is one thing. On the Western Balkan routes, we see, uh, one, yeah. we see an increase of almost 170%. Uh, this year, so far, more than 300,000 people have crossed our borders irregularly. We have monthly averages of plus 70,000 asylum applications in the European Union, and all this, indeed, is, is the highest numbers since 2016. Mm. And we all remember 2016. It was a crisis year. Yeah. And we, uh, we, we fear that we are sleepwalking into another crisis. We see reception capacity in many member states reaching its limits or already surpassed its limits. We see the situation in Belgium, in my own country, in the Netherlands. So something needs to, to happen. Uh, and it is frustrating, I think, for members of the parliament here that we had a crisis in 2015, 2016. We have been trying to put on reasonable proposals to solve these issues for the future. We are now six, seven years after the crisis and we still have to go back to our citizens and say, you know, wait a little bit more because we're, we're getting there. Yeah. For the first time now, it seems that we actually might be getting there. So I'm, 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 I'm a glass half full kind of guy. Okay. So I'm Why do you optimistic. think we're, get, we're getting there? Because well. thanks, thanks, to, thanks to Thomas uh, and the other negotiators also of the EPP group on those important files, we are making progress in the European Parliament and in the Council Finally, there is movement. Finally, the, the deadlock that has been there for many years between you know, different groups of countries, different groups of member states with different sets of interests mm. seems to be broken and there seems to be progress made. And, okay. and that is extremely important. And yeah. it's also up to the parliament now to seize this opportunity, to seize this moment and do our job here. 
Okay, so c can you tell us a little bit more, Thomas, about yeah. why this movement? How did this happen? But I think, I, to, to be honest, I think uh, many of our colleagues here in the European Parliament, but also, of course, many of uh, what we see from the governments in, in the member states, understand that we need to move beyond the rhetoric now and become pragmatic. We need mm -hmm. to find solution. And everybody understands that there is no silver bullet with, that will make everything perfect. I mean, right. it is a, co a complex question, of course, uh, when it comes to migration. but. What we see now is a readiness in the Council to actually commit to negotiation with the European Parliament. The Commission has uh, presented a migration pact. We are, of course, working intensively with that in the European Parliament and mm -hmm. getting ready for these negotiations. And we actually now have committed to a joint roadmap to actually finish this during this term. Okay. And of course, uh, I must say I'm hopeful. I really think there is an, an opportunity here. And uh, we will see now, there has been some movements in, in, in the last months. Uh, we will have the Swedish presidency coming up. Right. And of course, I'm, I'm quite hopeful that we will uh, see some real movement uh, during the coming months. Now, um, there are two things here. There's this e European Commission action plan that was announced uh, just recently. And there's that migration pact that was proposed back in 2020 that we're still working on, tr still trying to get approved. Yeah. But I mean, I mean, I mean of, of course, uh, we see different, what I would call ad hoc solutions that yeah. we will have to keep working on. You can yeah. see it from member states, but you also see it uh, from the European level. But what we will do with the migration pact is to actually to, to create a, a system uh, that will put in place something that would mean that we will have a greater protection of our external borders. Right. We will make a huge difference uh, between refugees, people that have a right to protection in Europe, right. but also that we must be very firm with irregular migration. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a right to asylum in Europe, you need to leave. And of course, this can be some, it's a harsh message, yeah. uh, of course, to give, but I think it's the only way. Okay. Because we want to have solidarity in Europe, but we cannot have a situation where we have too high numbers of regular migration. Member states feel that they cannot cope with it. Right. Citizens rightly ask the questions to politicians, what's happening? Why don't you take high responsibility for the situation? Mm -hmm. So. I really think it is an opportunity now, and we will try to seize it. Now, I think a, a part of what uh, supposedly made this, this new pact more probable, more likely, is that the, uh, the, the, the countries in the EU can uh, voluntarily take in uh, migrants, right? They don't, they're not required to. There's not a, a formula where they're required to. Um, is that the stumbling block that was I mean, uh, removed? Uh, I, I mean... Uh, the, po the position of the European Parliament have for many, many years basically been that is that we need an automatic mandatory relocation for all. Yeah, but it didn't work. And, and, and of course, I mean, uh, the appetite for that is not big uh, in the member states. Right. The member states feel that they also want to have some kind of control, you know. Mm. And uh, I, think, I think the way to do this is actually to work on a more voluntary basis for the member states. Of right. course, we need to have hard measures if we come into a crisis mode. Uh, then we have to have more mandatory measures as well. But I think, you know, to have some countries that will actually work uh, to take voluntary uh, relocation. Mm. And of course, if we can have the regular, regular migration go down, then it will be easier to solve. Yeah. Because it will not be, the numbers will not be as high. But we also need member states to work with capacity building. So, I mean, it is making sure that every member state, in a way, have to, uh, they have to put something on the table. Right. They all have a responsibility. We're all members of the European Union. We have common borders. But, of course, we need to find more pragmatic solutions. Right, right. You know, let me ask you about this, this action plan, because it's kind um, of an interim thing. Do you maybe want to maybe on that first, that? because okay. I think it's very important also what, what Thomas said in the beginning, that we right. need to move from, from rhetoric to, to pragmatism. And right. this is the same when it comes to solidarity. You know, we need to go to something that works. And we all know that if you're going to force certain measures upon measures, member states, it will not work in practice. If you can do this on a way where everybody can voluntarily participate, it will work. And I think the main underlying principle must be that in the end, the voluntary cooperation of all the member states needs to be sufficient to solve the problem of 
the countries of first arrival. So we do this voluntary basis, but right. the, the cumulative voluntariness of, of this must be enough to also make sure that countries like Italy and Greece are not standing alone. Yeah. And I think that is the key, the key consideration that, that is uh, underlying. And then we can have whole debates on whether it must be mandatory or voluntarily. We need a system that works, mm -hmm. full stop. Okay, let me ask you about this action plan. Three parts to it. One, working with partner countries and international organizations. Two, more coordinated approach on search and rescue. Three, reinforcing the voluntary solidarity mechanism. Uh, is that enough at the moment? Does that work? But it's a step and also this action plan needs to be seen in, in correlation with what we're doing for the long term yeah. because the action plan is indeed ad hoc. I think the underlying principles are good. We need to work closer with third countries, countries of origin, countries of transit, mm -hmm. because if you want to save lives in the Mediterranean, if you want to prevent people from dying because they are pushed on to unseaworthy uh, vessels mm -hmm. by not scrupulous uh, people smugglers who earn a lot of money on this, uh, then you need to prevent them to getting on those boats in the first time. You need to have uh, systems in place to have reception capacity on the other side of the Mediterranean, right. to inform people about their rights, about their perspectives, and to make sure that they can return to their countries of origin without risking their lives at the Mediterranean Sea. And therefore, it is absolutely crucial to work together with countries of origin. This needs to be part of a mm. broad agenda. We need to invest in these countries, help them with their border management, help them with their reception capacity, help them with their, their fight against criminal gangs, because yeah. it is a multi-billion yeah. dollar business yeah. that is at the yeah. expense it's of the most business. vulnerable of our societies. Mm -hmm. So it's absolutely, absolutely crucial. And I think this is also one of the key priorities of the EPP, to work with these countries, to work along the whole route of migration from the countries of origin to all the routes where they come through. Because now what we see, uh, and this is something important, we see sometimes asylum seekers from Bangladesh traveling to Europe through Northern Africa. Yeah. That is in, 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 no, in no way is that a, is that a natural uh, route to, to find safety. Mm -hmm. So we need to work on, on uh, third country cooperation. We need to work on this voluntary uh, relocation mechanism. And the third, better coordination of search and rescue. Yes, of course. I mean, yeah. if, if you see that member states like Greece and Italy, or um, in this France and Italy, are having public fights about boats of, 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 of migrants, mm -hmm. it hurts the credibility of the whole of the European Union. We need to have solutions for that, uh, and, and they need to work. How do we address this issue about pushbacks? I mean, the, 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 the head of Frontex lost his job in part because of that. Yeah. How do we deal with that? Well, I think it is important to, to understand, of course, everyone has the right to request uh, asylum in mm. Europe. And of course, we should uh, respect fundamental rights. But at the same time, of course, also, there is an obligation to protect the European border. Mm. And of course, uh, when we are on land, it's, it's quite easy to understand what is the border and, and how you can work with that. At sea, of course, it's more complicated. Um, and, and that's why we always come back to this uh, discussion, you know. Uh, I think f from many of our colleagues from the left, they mean that any kind of border procedure uh, c could sometimes be felt as a pushback. But I think it is important for us to understand that what we have seen in, in Greece, for example, mm -hmm. What I see from Greece is they are, taking, they are taking a responsibility also for Europe to protect the European common border. And I think that is important to understand as well. Okay. Um, let me so just... Adding, yeah, go ahead. Adding, adding to that, uh, yeah. I fully agree with what we said. And of course, we need to protect our borders in line with fundamental rights and all the treaties that we are party to. And mm -hmm. this, is also, you know, this is also what European values are about. But we see also that our neighboring countries uh, have a very different approach to this. And we don't only... Uh, have to talk about pushbacks, but we also need to talk about push forwards. Yeah. We see Belarus. countries like Belarus, also yeah. Turkey, Turkey under Erdogan, pushing, pushing very vulnerable people, often yeah. with violence across the border, yeah. to make a political yeah. point. To, to weaponize violence. Part, right? part of, a, yeah. of a hybrid warfare. And we need to protect ourselves against that. Mm -hmm. And we also mm -hmm. need to have the proper instruments to do so. So also as part of the discussion on the Pact of Migration, we need to look at this instrumentalization of migration by other countries in order to try and destabilize the European Union. It's, it's an essential part that does not get enough uh, attention here in the European Parliament. 
Okay, uh, let me um, add a bit of criticism from Human Rights Watch about this uh, European Commission action plan. It says it's a missed opportunity, that it strengthens regimes in North Africa, like Libya. Um, what's your reaction to that? What do you think? Well, I mean, uh, I think everybody can understand uh, that, uh, I mean, Libya is not uh, a country that is similar to, to most member it's, states it, in Europe. It's a failed it, it, state. It's, yeah, I mean, of course, yes. Yeah. So, of course, we have huge problems in Libya. I mean, we have huge problems in, in Turkey as well. Yeah. But we have to understand that these are the countries that are surrounding us. And we need to work with them. Because if we would not work with them, then we will give even, even better opportunities for criminal gangs, for the smugglers, to do even more. Mm -hmm. And we, we cannot have this situation. So of course we need uh, to find different ways to cooperate with them. Uh, and right. I, th I think this is, this is really important to understand. Of course we can have criticism. Uh, we should always stand up for the values that we have in the European Union. But uh, it is naive to think that you cannot cooperate with countries that you might have opinions about. You mm -hmm. have to understand that the, the complex question of migration really, really uh, pushed for the need for Europe to cooperate with more. Um, the European Commission has just adopted uh, this week uh, a 220 million euro package to improve border control at uh, Turkey's eastern border. That brings it to 1.2 billion uh, in EU assistance for this. Um, is this right to do? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely, because the you know there are countries that are in charge of our external borders. Uh, the, the 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 external borders of the Netherlands, my countries, are no longer in the area where I live, the very south of the Netherlands, but they are also in Lesbos and in Lampedusa. Mm -hmm. And it is a joint uh, responsibility to make sure that our external border management is up to date and it's a joint responsibility to also help these countries at our external borders to pay for it. And I actually think we could mm. go in further. Mm. Uh, in our, in our uh, the migration paper of the EPP, we call also to fund physical border infrastructure in, on the external borders of the European Union because mm. this is something that the Commission so far refuses to do. But again, when we see what Lukashenko tried to do uh, at the eastern yeah. external borders, yeah. We cannot just say, OK, you can, you can build a, a fence to stop Lukashenko from doing it, but you cannot get a single euro cent from the European Commission to do so. Mm -hmm. We need to take these threats seriously, and we need to also help those member states. That's also part of solidarity. Yeah, yeah. There's also a connection with other issues, um, with um, Schengen, yeah, for yeah. instance. <laughs> I mean, Bulgaria, Romania, they didn't get in to Schengen, in part because of this migration issue, right? Yeah. How do we solve that? Well, uh, this, is a, this is a long story, but I mean, of course, this is, uh, this is very serious. Uh, I mean, for, from, uh, for EPP, I think, uh, I mean, Schengen is a great success. Uh, mm. And I, of course, we need to be very serious with evaluation. Uh, but I think it's very clear when you look at Croatia, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, that they are ready uh, to join Schengen. Mm. And, uh, but, but, but I think it's, it's obvious now that uh, the resistance that we have seen uh, in council is yes, mm -hmm. uh, at least in rhetoric, linked to the question of migration. Yeah. But for me, the question of migration, I mean, we have huge problems, for example, in Austria. We know that they have, have had a lot of irregular migration. And, I and fully, they, were, they were the stumbling block to this. To let I would say in. they were in the forefront, yes. Yeah. And, and of course, uh, I can understand that. But I, I, I must say that I think in a way that they, uh, uh, they should, I, I think they should lo look in another direction instead. I think it is more important then to make sure that we very soon can adopt the migration pact. That is a better mm. way actually mm. to solve the situation that we have in Austria instead of going in the direction uh, to not have Romania and Bulgaria join, you know. Yeah. And I mean, if I take it in my home country in Sweden, uh, we just got a new pro-European EPP-led government. Mm -hmm. We took the decision to be in favor of them uh, joining uh, Schengen. Uh, and then we saw the, the populists and the socialists in the beginning joining forces to say no. Uh, we, we managed to solve this uh, question in Sweden as well, because it was the same rhetoric. This will mean something for the migration. But yeah. 
you, you cannot link the question of Schengen to migration as easily uh, as many politicians are trying to do. Yeah, you know? I think in, in, in the Netherlands there's a fair amount of reluctance, isn't there, too, on, on um, allowing more migration. I think that's an issue. How do you no, definitely because how we, do you deal with that as 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 an elected person from the Netherlands? No, but we've maybe. seen that we've seen in the in the Netherlands uh, terrible images of of people sleeping uh, sleeping outside the the reception facilities because there was no more no more room. But we sure. see a huge increase in um, in applications in the Netherlands. We see a huge increase in family reunification mm -hmm. because this is one of the recurring issues in the Netherlands. We have asylum applications, people get international protection, but that does not mean just one person, because in the end it means that five, six, sometimes seven people come over, and it really stresses uh, the reception capacity of the Netherlands to the max. So we also really, uh, what the first sentence was that Thomas said this morning, um, we really need to look at, at decreasing irregular migration into the European Union, and for this the pact for this, the pact is absolutely necessary, and yeah. I think this is a widely shared feeling among the Dutch, um, the Dutch population. What about visa-free travel? Do we want to talk about that? About the, it's 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 quite a hot but issue no, the, right the, now, right? No, but the visa-free travel in, in such is not a problem because, of course, before we yeah. before we give green light for any country in the world to have visa-free travel to the EU, we carefully check. You know what the risks are in terms of irregular migration, yeah. and if there are risks, we can always suspend the visa-free yeah. application. What we see happening is not that there's a problem with the EU visa policy. Mm. We see that a country like Serbia, that enjoys visa-free travel to the European Union, does not synchronize its visa policy with that of the EU. So we see a lot of people coming in through Serbia who would not be allowed without a visa ah. to enter the European Union, but they found a loophole through Serbia. So it's absolutely essential that Serbia stops doing this right. and uh, synchronizes its policy as soon as possible as a candidate mm -hmm. country of the European Union sure. with that of the European Union, and then that problem will not be relevant anymore. I'm sure that was quite an issue uh, during this Balkan summit last week as well. Um, anything yes, else course. to add to that? Uh, no, I think, yeah. uh, I think you're wrong covered. It. Okay, why don't we... Um, Talk about the expectations of uh, this uh, Swedish presidency yes. regarding uh, this migration pact. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, we th there were high hopes that during this Czech presidency, this last half of 2022, that it would actually happen. It didn't. No, but uh, how, I, does it, how does it look for the first half of uh, 2023 with a Swedish presidency? I think it is important to, to, to be fair. Uh, the Czech presidency, I would say, have done more than uh, any of us could expect, actually. They have pushed it along. They have really pushed it, I, I yeah. must say, and I think that is, uh, it, it is important to acknowledge, actually, uh, yeah. what they have been able to do. I mean, the new Swedish government is now very committed uh, to, uh, to deliver. Uh, we will start uh, the first trilogues now on Eurodac, for example. Uh, okay. we, will, we will start with that and uh, we will also uh, adopt uh, some of the proposals that we have uh, been waiting to adopt since the last term. Uh, and I think we will, we will hopefully during the end of the Swedish presidency, we will go into uh, the real hard discussions on, on how to solve, uh, especially the solidarity question, uh, solidarity which of course is, is the hard one. Yeah. But, but to be honest, I think a reasonable timetable is that the, Swedes, uh, should, uh, when the Swedish government now must make sure that we start the negotiation with a very high pace, uh, then the Spanish presidency will come, and that is the mm -hmm. huge opportunity to adopt everything. Mm -hmm. And I think it is important. I mean, we are we are willing to do it uh, piece by piece, but of course, it is the balance of the whole pact that is important. You need yeah. to have both solidarity and responsibility, and that is important for European Parliament. Of course, also important for the for the member states. Okay. Um, and the Swedish government uh, has been very clear and is very committed to do the job now. So okay. I'm hopeful. Um, <clears throat> this action plan. Well, I share be, uh, his optimism completely. Share, uh, yeah. uh, by the way, because we have we have high hopes for the Swedish presidency on this. Also, not only because of the Swedish presidency, but because all the the member states seem to have a more constructive approach than we we see in the past. Mm -hmm. And for me, 2024 is the crucial date 
Uh, we had a crisis in 2015, 2016. We went into the elections in 2019 empty handed, even yeah. though migration is the number one concern. You've got to have something in hand before that. Millions, election. millions of European citizens. Yeah. And we cannot allow, as Europeans, regardless of which political party or which member state you are, we cannot allow to go to the 2024 elections with not uh, an adopted and, and fully, uh, fully functioning migration pact. Could this action plan that the Commission is trying to make happen right now could that be like a confidence building measure toward getting to this uh migration pact absolutely because it's it's a direct mm -hmm. it's a direct response of of the sort of the, the the crisis we've seen between member states on what happens in the mediterranean yeah and we have to have member states at the table talking to each other about how we're going to solve this as a union together mm -hmm. instead of fighting with each other and in that sense this is a very important step is, is migration the Achilles heel of the EU? What do you think about that, analyst, saying that? Well, uh, I think it's for sure is one of uh, the main challenges that we have. And I think it is important for Europe because it, 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 there is uh, a lack of trust. Yeah. There is a lack of trust uh, between member states, mm -hmm. uh, but also a lack of trust from citizens. And I think this is also uh, important because I think that it is, it, it's reasonable for citizens uh, to go and elect uh, politicians to solve the most, uh, the most biggest challenges. Yeah. And of course, we have a lot of things that we work in the European Parliament. We have to make sure that we can reach the climate goals. We have to get Europe more uh, competitive. Uh, we have to, of course, deal with uh, that Europe is in war and we have to support Ukraine. But it's also reasonable uh, to actually expect that we can deliver on something that is a, a common issue. This, there's no member state who can solve this on their own. Single so hand. we need a European approach. Yeah. So uh, let's see. Great. Uh, Thomas, Jeroen, thank you very much. I'll let you guys get back thank to you. work here. Uh, thank you all for uh, uh, joining us on uh, this discussion on migration. Uh, at EPP Group is the handle if you want to... Uh, cast wider on the social networks and uh, take a look at eppgroup.eu for further information. My name is Chris Burns. See you next time.